Pastor Daniel kicked off week one as a new year, new mindset. Come on, how many enjoyed that message last week? Wasn't it great? If you missed it, you can go back to our YouTube channel podcast and make sure you, you go about that. And we have a theme scripture for our series. And I didn't tell you to turn there, but I'm just going to read it to you real quick. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says this, if my people, by the way, you're his people. Come on, amen? Come on, all right? How many love Jesus? Where are you at? Make some noise. You love Jesus? All right. He's talking to you. My people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. In other words, how strong is your relationship and your walk with Jesus? He says, then, that's a powerful word in Scripture. Every time you see the word then, God is saying, I'm getting ready to do something in your life, but this has to happen first. If you'll humble yourself, if you'll pray, you'll seek my face, you'll turn away from your wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven. Then he will hear your prayer, and I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their, their land. Now, you got to put their land into the context of your life. Then their land was their property, what they were believing God for. So their land, when God says you'll heal your land, he's talking about whatever it is that you're believing God for and you're praying for, that's your land. Whatever it is, like maybe it's your family. Whatever it is you're praying for for 21 days in prayer and fasting, that's your land, your marriage, your family. You're believing for a healing in your body. Whatever it is, God says, hey, I will hear from heaven and I will heal that in your life. That's good news, Amen. Then we're focusing on the word yield. What does it mean to reset? What does it mean to yield? Yield means two meanings, if we want to write this down. The first meaning is what I'm going to focus on today, is truly surrendering to the Lord. Like you're close to Jesus, but how close are you really to Jesus? Do I need to, to pause? Do I need to yield? Maybe I got some cracks in my foundation of my relationship with Jesus. We need to get the foundation set again because how many know you can't build anything on an uneven ground, right? Then the second meaning of yield is believing for a harvest, believing that God's going to do great things. How many would agree one year from now you're going to be better than you are right now? Am I right? I believe you already shouted, you already said that you don't believe this is going to be a good year, but you believe it's going to be a great year, right? So a harvest is coming before you and God wants to do good things for you but sometimes you need to take the first of the year and yield. Am I, am I truly surrendering to the Lord? What does my walk with Jesus really look like? Because I'm believing big things for me and my family. Amen? That's what I want to talk about what it truly means to have a walk with Jesus. Look what it says in God's word. We'll pray and then we'll jump in. Ephesians 3 verse 17 says this. If you're there, can I get a yeah? Come on, all right? Awesome. Two people. Here we go. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3, verse 17, you see it on the screens. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts. It's important, I want you to remember that. Underline that in your Bible because it's gonna be the theme of what I talk about here today. The Bible says that your heart is like a house and he wants to be in the home of your heart. It says as you trust in him, it says your roots will grow down into God's love And here's the key, and it will keep you strong. How many don't want to just start something, but you want to finish something? Am I right? In fact, this last week, if you didn't know, was National Quitters Day. Because people already, we just a couple weeks in, like, man, I got these new resolutions. They're going to be amazing. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And they already done quit. Anybody know somebody like that? Don't look at them. Don't put it. But how many want to say, hey, One year from now, I made a statement that I didn't just start something, but I stayed strong and I finished something. Am I right? It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Skip over to the next next chapter, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read out the message translation. It says this. Now, here's the challenge from the Lord. He said, but that's no life for you. You learned Christ. In other words, you know Jesus. You know what he stands for. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to him. You've been well instructed in the truth. In other words, you know Jesus, you know his word. How many would agree on that? Amen. He says, precisely as we have it, Jesus, since then, 
We do not have the excuses of ignorance. And I do mean everything connected with, here it is, with that old way of life. Notice these next three words. It has to go. No more bad thinking. No more bad habits. No more bad behaviors. No more bad addictions. How many would agree? What you had last year, we ain't going to bring it into this year, right? It's got to go. Somebody shout, it's got to go. It's got to go. It's rotten through and through, and you know it's got to go. So let it go. Get rid of it. Then here's the challenge, the word and. And then take on an entirely new way of life. And here's the life found in Jesus. A God-fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your, I love this, into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. Amen? He says your heart is like a house. He wants to make his home in your heart. But going into this year, maybe you need to reset because there's some things you need to let it go. It's rotten. You got relationships that you don't need to bring with you. You got places you don't need to bring with you. Bad habits, behaviors. You got Instagram accounts you don't need to bring with you. Hello, right? You got TikTok follow, you, you let it go. Think you got to let it go. And God says, it's time to take on a new life. So if you're taking notes, here's the time of my message today. All righty? You know it already. It's a new me. Come on. Somebody shout, it's a new me. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, it's a new me. You're going to look to your other neighbor and say, you're going to see new me. But apologize for picking them second because you're your second choice, I guess, right? All right, come on, one more time. Somebody shout, it's a new me. Come on, how many believe some of you, we're going to walk up this year, people are going to walk up to you and be like, man, what's different about you? Well, it's a new me. I changed some things in my life, right? I made Jesus a little bit more center in my life. You're going to walk around, people are going to notice something different about you. You walk with a swagger right now. You walk with something that's different, like, man, what's wrong with you? Ain't nothing wrong with me. I just found Jesus again. It's a new me. Gee, let's pray. Jesus, do your thing. Keep blessing the Texans. Amen. Here we go. All right, here we go. Y'all like quick prayers? I do. Come on. Definitely like those folks where you ask them to pray over dinner, and they, they like trying to get the whole restaurant saved. I'm, I'm just trying to eat my water burger, bro. Let's go. <laughs> it's a new, it's a new me. It's a new me. Anybody have those friends that, uh, that invite themselves over? Anybody have those people who just showed up unexpectedly to their house? How many of y'all those people right now? Get on some church. Don't lie. Lord's looking. All right, I appreciate the honesty. That's all right. I appreciate that. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm not throwing shade. My wife um, grew up in a very small town in Arkansas. And her parents, they love people. They're some of the sweetest people in the world. But they didn't have people over at the house a whole lot. It was just kind of there and when it's convenient. Now, for me and my house, it was like a party every night at the Barber house. I mean, we had people over every single night. It, it was what? Anybody else relate to that? Come on, like, like there was somebody coming over. So I, sometimes I didn't even know who they were. They were like coming in. That was the culture that my parents built, especially when me and my sisters got into, into sports and my father got into coaching and different things like that. There was somebody spending the night over at the house every single night. My mom knew we ain't cooking for five. We cooking for at least 10 or 12 people every night. That's how my mama rolled. She was like, yo, you around? Come on in, baby. Like, that's how we, that's just how we rolled at the barber house. Let me know if I got any of the family like that. Where you at? Good, I'm coming to your house. Let's go. Here we are. That's just, that's just how we rolled. And I absolutely love it. It's my passion. I, I love spending time with people. Love inviting people over to our home. It's just, it's just who we are. But I'll never forget, I used to do this uh, to my wife quite a bit. I would, in the first year of marriage, I would just bring people over unexpectedly. I'd just be, I'd just be like, I'd just walk in the house with like seven people, and she walks in, she goes, okay. <laughs> and she cooked the dinner for two people, and I brought like seven. And I realized real quick, if I want to have a healthy marriage, something's going to have to change. And all the ladies said, amen. amen. So I thought. And I would do this quite a bit. Then I learned, I learned that if something was going to happen, I'm going to have to at least give a courtesy call or a heads up. Am I right? And uh, sometimes that works and sometimes it don't. 
But I'll never forget this one time, <clears throat> true story. We were walking in HEB. Come on, how many love our HEB family? Let's go. How many miss pre-COVID HEB where you can get some free tortillas? Am I right? Can I get an amen? Like, I didn't need to go to Costco to feed my kids on samples anymore. I just got to go to H- HEB. Kind of missed that a little bit. Prophetically speaking, bring the tortillas back. Can I get an amen? Okay, thank you. But I'll never forget pulling around like the bread aisle at HEB. And, and I pulled in, and all of a sudden, I ran into some friends that I haven't seen in a minute. And I was like, Bill and Karen. It's like, hey. We ran into each other and just had that moment. Oh, my God. Ah, we haven't seen it. It's just like having the whole moment. It's like, it's amazing. It's so good to see you guys. And then I'll never forget that I, uh, I looked at him. I was like, I, um, I said, hey, guys, man, I tell you what, man, Kristen would love to see you. You guys should come over sometime. And they're like, that's amazing. We can come over right now. <laughs> and I knew I had a big decision to make for my marriage. So I came up with something. It's a true story. Came up with something, and I was like, yeah, well, you know, uh, man, that would be great, but we got a really big grocery order, and uh, I got to go drop this off first, and then I actually got to come back to the grocery store and get some more stuff. So I don't know if this would work. I'm like, no, 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 that's perfect. We'll leave our car here, and we'll just ride with you. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. <laughs> Best day ever. They them friends. <laughs> so, so we get in the car, and I know I got to call my wife. So I call Kristen, and I get on the phone, and I'm like, hey, babe, hey, hey, babe, hey, it's me, Brandon. Yeah, Brandon. She's like, why are you identifying yourself, bro? I said, hey, you remember my friends, uh, our friends, the people that you just love more than anybody, you know, them friends, like uh, Bill and Karen. You, you remember these guys? She's like, yeah, I remember that. I said, well, guess what? You'll never believe what happened. I ran into them at the bread aisle. We were trying to get a tortilla, but we couldn't get a tortilla. And I saw them, and we talked. And guess what? They're in the car right now, and we're 10 minutes from home. Now, if you know my wife, she's the sweetest, like most peaceful person you could ever be a, a part. She is just incredible. She is a gift to me because you can see I'm everywhere. I'm just like, let's go. She brings balance to my life, which is absolutely incredible. But she's like any other mama and any other wife that sometimes she might lose Jesus a little bit. Come on, anybody relate? Any mama just want to say, hey, Jesus, stay right here for five minutes. I'm going to be right back while I talk to my husband. Ladies, just wave at me. Am I right? Moms, okay, okay, yeah. Is that right? And so you would think, like, so was my wife peaceful on that phone? Nope. In fact, my wife is like, I said, we're on our way, baby. She's like, what? No. No, don't do this again, Brandon. No. Don't, no, no. No. No, the kids just got eating dinner. They, they, got, they ate spaghetti. It's everywhere. Laundry is all over the house. They've not been bathed. Your son just pooped his pants for the third time today. No, no, no. Guys, she is so excited to see you. Can you hear the excitement in her voice? Can you just hear it through the phone? Man, she's like, I haven't seen them in forever. <laughs> this is amazing. And then I go back, and I've done what all y'all had done. And you realize she already done hung up. And I had to pretend. Come on, come on, don't lie in church. Don't leave me hanging up here. And I'm like, yeah, I love you too, boo boo. Yeah, yeah, I love you, baby. Yeah, I didn't even, I don't know why I did a kiss. It's like just trying to say, like, we, we'll see you soon. I can't wait. Click. So we roll up. Now, what do you think's happening in my house right now? Absolute chaos. They're running around. I can just imagine my wife screaming at everybody, let's go. And they're taking everything and anything and stuffing it into every cabinet, corner, and closet in the house. And if it is out of play, then if it's out of sight, then it's in play. Just put everything in the master bedroom. Ain't nobody going to go in there, right? Come on. Has anybody else done this? Come on, all right? It's like if it's out of sight, we just got to go. We got we to hurry. We got people coming. So here we are, we, we roll up to the house, and usually when I bring guests to our house, I like to walk them into the house myself. But I felt led by the Holy Ghost that day that I should not be the first to walk into my house, and I should be a good servant and let them walk in first, because I didn't know if today was going to be, <laughs> I might meet Jesus today, I don't know, right? But we walk into this house, bro. 
We walk into the house, and I walk in, and the house is immaculate. She's got every candle from, from Bath and Body Works lit in the house. We got like Kenny G playing in the background. I'm like, Kenny G, what's going on? Right, like we walk in, my wife comes walking out of the kitchen with fresh baked cookies. And I'm like, you baked cookies? I try to get one. She slapped my hand, said, you don't deserve that. I said, you're right, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that cookie. Everything was perfect. And Bill and Karen are walking around in her house like, pastor, it's so peaceful here. The tangible presence of God is just so evident in this house. Is it like this all the time? I'm like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> it's amazing. Just, it's just a pastor's house of peace. That's what's happening. Having no clue, no clue that 10 minutes ago, we're literally screaming at our children. They stink like, like, they stink like crazy. We don't have time for a bath, so we literally line them up and we Febreze them from head to toe. Just to make you think we good parents. Come on, y'all don't leave me hanging right now. Come on, I know y'all done do this before. We all do this, am I right? We have a hard time when somebody's coming over. We'll, we'll take the moment and we'll stuff everything into every cabinet corner and closet of our house. Why? Because we don't want nobody seeing our junk and we don't know want nobody seeing our trash. We try to put this picture in front of people like everything's all right. Because you don't want people to see your pain. You don't want people to see your shame. And can I tell you, friends, we do it with people, but if we get humble like the scripture we read, this is exactly what we do with God. Because all of a sudden, what we'll do is you got that one thing that's keeping you tripped up, that one bad behavior, that one bad addiction. You love all of the Bible, but that one scripture is kind of hard to obey because you want it to fit more your lifestyle. And it's like you, you go here and you, you go there, and you want God to, like, you want to give 90% of God, but 90% of God is not all of God. 98% of your heart is not all of God. And we tuck everything into our pain, into every cabinet corner and closet of our heart, just hoping God's gonna overlook it. Can I encourage you, friends? How many know you might can try to hide it, but God sees everything? God is saying, I'm coming for your heart. And here's a few things. If you wanna have a genuine relationship with Jesus. You got to talk about those things that you're tucking into the corners of your heart, hoping that nobody sees and hoping that God overlooks. How true and how real is your relationship with Jesus? Y'all still love me? Are y'all good? Okay. Number one is this. You're going to take notes. If you want to let Jesus into the house of your heart, you got to let him in. I know it sounds simple. But you got to let Jesus in. You got to let him in. Anybody remember that first moment that uh, you met Jesus? Come on, anybody remember that first moment? Man, that first moment you met him in church. Maybe you were in a church pew. Maybe you're a church kid like me. I don't know where you met him, but I remember feeling the presence of God for that first time in your life. Come on, anybody show of hands. I'll, ne I'll never forget it. I'll never forget. I grew up in a Christian house, in a Christian home. I'm so thankful that my parents, they, weren't, they didn't necessarily live for the Lord, uh, but then they got, they actually, my parents got married, and then they went through a separation, and my dad actually, uh, he was at that time playing uh, in the NFL, and uh, he had just got radically saved, and his first time, he was preaching at the Billy Graham Crusade at Rice Stadium, and that night, my mom was sitting in the stands, and they got back together, and I'm here, so I love Billy Graham. Come on, right? <laughs> But from that moment, they, they built a Christian home. They built it on, and I grew up with a, with a praying mama and a praying grandmama. And I'm so, how many thankful for a praying mama and a praying grandmama, right? I mean, there was multiple times that I was in my 
Multiple times I was in my room. She thought I was asleep, but I was pretending to be, a, be asleep. My mom was walking in, praying in the spirit, and just praying over me left and right and believing God for me. Even And I, I, got a, I got a granny who's 98 years old praying all the time. I mean, she's just an absolutely incredible. She'll call me a couple times a year and give me a prophet at work. It maybe last 13 seconds. She'll say, hey, honey, the Lord talked to me about you today. Go ahead, granny. Boom, boom, boom. She'll tell it to me. Go, That's it. Love you. Goodbye. Click. Boom. But I'm thankful for that in my life. That's why I love 21 days of prayer and fasting and why our pastor's heart is to make this a foundation that we are a house of prayer, amen? We are a house that are gonna believe in God's presence. And, and so I, I grew up in this household and y'all know, if you know a prayer warrior, there ain't one prayer warrior that I don't know that's got some kind of anointing oil on them, Come on, right? Some of y'all probably got it on you right now if you're a prayer warrior. I grew up in times where my mom, my grandma, they they pray and they they anoint. And I woke up one time. I remember going through a heathen season. Anybody ever went through a season where you just sinned well? Come on, anybody like? It was like my particle sun season. I woke up one night in the middle of the night and I thought the ceiling had a drip in it from like water or something with like a broken pipe or leak. And I woke up and I realized it was my mom taking the whole bottle of oil and pouring all over my head. I was like, what's going on? She's just praying and telling you like, get out in the name of Jesus. Devil, you will not have my son. Just going, come on, I've been thankful for that praying mama and grandma. It's like, boom. I had oil everywhere. I was, I'm sorry. I just threw my hands up like, Jesus, just so she stopped true story. But I'll never forget the moment. I'll never forget my household, and I'm so thankful for growing up. That scripture, for me and my house, we will serve, we'll serve the Lord. I'll never forget at eight years old, I'm just sharing my story today. Is that all right? At eight years old, it's the first moment I was in Phoenix, Arizona at a conference with my family, and at eight years old is when I encountered Jesus. It was in that moment where God, the Holy Spirit, came into my life and got my prayer language and changed my life. And at eight years old, I got a prophetic word that I'm living out that word today. And I'm so thankful for it. I'll never forget that moment at eight years old when I gave the Lord my heart. And can I just say right now, by the way, I was eight years old. I, I, just, wanna, I just wanna honor and celebrate real quick. Can I tell you, we have the best kids pastors and kids church. Can we give it up for Hope City Kids right now? Come on, I mean it. I need you to hear like, I am who I am. I am a product of an amazing children's ministry. Y'all know they're not just back there babysitting, right? Your kids are out there right now. Your kids are hearing the tangible. They're hearing the word of God. They're hearing the power of the Holy Spirit. They're hearing that he is a God the same yesterday, today, and forever. And they can lay hands at eight years old and believe for healing just as much as you and me. Come on, are you with me? How many thankful that we have pastors in a church who's got an incredible kids ministry? I'm who I am today because a church loved me enough and cared enough about kids ministry. And I'm just going to go ahead and put a little plug in here right now. If you haven't noticed, our church is growing. And our church is growing fast. Every service is packed. And keep on coming. Keep inviting friends. But you know what that means? We got more families. We got more kids over there. And here's what I want to ask you. We need about 20 or 30 more people to help serving kids. And I know you're like, man, that's a mission field. That's all right. It's okay. You can serve once a month. I'm asking you, if our kids team has been a blessing to your child, will you help just serve once a month to help be a blessing to a new family coming here today? Come on. Are y'all with me? Come on. I think we can do that. So I'm asking you, when you leave here today, you'll see that blue connection tent. Stop and tell our team, say, hey, I want to jump on the kids team. I want to help. We together, when our church family grows, how many know we do whatever it takes to help serve and to love people? Hey, one more time, give it up for our kids' ministry. Come on, show them some love. Hope City Kids. When it comes to relationship with Jesus, we got to let him in. And I got say, I gave Jesus my heart at eight years old. I got to be honest with you, friends. I didn't fully give my heart to God until I was 23 years old. In other words, I thought I was walking in salvation, but I was not walking in true salvation. I want to show you a scripture where it proves what I'm talking about. Well, what does it mean to walk in a true relationship with Jesus? Ezekiel 36, verse 26 says this. It says, I will give you a new heart, and I will give you a new mind, 
and I will take away your stubborn heart of stone, and I will give you an obedient heart. Here's what I learned about my walk with Jesus is that, yes, I gave Jesus my heart, but I had yet to give him an obedient heart. I had learned that a true relationship with Jesus, that there's a difference between being of Christ and being in Christ Jesus. There's a difference between a fan and there's a difference between a follower. A fan will show you the passion at the game, but a follower will keep that passion Monday through Saturday. I see people walking in the house of God, and I know that because I was one of them. I would come in on a Sunday, and I would put up my front while I got things hidden in my heart, and I would throw my hands up, I will serve, I will tithe, I will lay it all on the field with passion, but my character did not match Monday through Saturday. And I don't know about you, maybe, I'm sorry, maybe I'm not trying to rant or anything, but I'm worried about where culture is heading today and how loose we are with the relationship with Jesus. We, we got to stop playing Tetris with the Bible where we make the Bible fit into our lifestyle. We make it fit into our values. We make it fit into the identity that we want. We don't play Tetris with the Bible. The Bible is our foundation. That's what we build our values on. That's what we build our strength upon. This is where we come from. God's not just looking for your heart. He's looking for an obedient heart. Do you hear me? My question to you, friends, and please hear me, I hope you hear my heart, is are you walking in true salvation? Because it's not preached about a lot, but there is a heaven and there is a hell. And I want to party with you here, but I really want to party with you up there. And don't be like me where I met God at eight, but I didn't start following him until I was 23. Because he had my heart, but he didn't have an obedient heart. How do you know if you're walking in true salvation? There's a great scripture, the one I told you to hold a bookmark in. It's Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7. The Bible says in scripture that we are like trees planted by the water. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you a tree, you a tree. Look at your other neighbor and say, you an oak. You an, I don't know what that means, but okay, here we go. You an oak. Matthew 7. This is how you know if you're walking in true salvation. This is a check for me. This is where I yield. This is where I ask myself, do I need a reset? Do I need to realign my foundation? How true am I following Jesus? Are y'all with me? Can I get an amen? Come on, yeah, all right. Matthew 7, verse 16, verse 20. Says this, you will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs or from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Verse 18, here's the key, focus. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire. Verse 20, therefore, here it is again, By their fruits, they will know them. People will know you by your fruits. This was me. I was a bad tree trying to produce good fruit. I sat in church services. I went to groups. I was giving. I was was doing everything. God had my heart, but he did not have an obedient heart. And I was like, God, I'm, try- I'm a bad tree trying to produce good fruit. You know when everything started to change with me? is when I started be- stopped being a bad tree and I started being a good tree. My language changed. My walk changed. My values changed. I maybe lost some friends, but I gained Jesus. And I'll take Jesus every day and at every moment because he has never left me and he has never forsaken me. And can I tell you right now, we're not a church where we're going to come out here and call out all your problems and be like, yo, what's wrong with you, bro? You're going to hell. Ah. Not like a mean Sunday school teacher. Anybody have that mean Sunday school teacher? Like, you better stop acting up, Billy. You're going to hell. Ah. You need to come with me to heaven. I remember thinking, like, like if you're going to heaven, I don't want to go there. If you're there, like, you mean. A job isn't to say, turn or burn, to call out your pain, to call out your problems. But I can tell you, as your pastors... And leaders in this house, it is our job to be your fruit inspector. You got to have somebody in your life that's saying, hey, I ain't seen some good fruit lately. 
Is there a crack in the foundation of your relationship with Jesus? Are you truly walking with an obedient heart? I hope y'all still love me. Come on, you right? You got to not just let Jesus in, but you got to let him take over. Got to let him take over. So what if I was to say, hey, guys, Jesus wants to come and take a tour of the home of your, house, of your heart. You invite Jesus into your house, which is your heart. What would Jesus see if he was looking into your heart right now? I can imagine it, my story. I'm walking into the house. I'm inviting Jesus in like, Jesus, what's up? Come on in. We got like a cool handshake. I don't know what it is. He walks into the house. We come in, and he's, he notices that I got my frankincense candle from Bed Bath & Beyond lit, you know. Walk through the living room. I got worship music playing, even though he knows I just turned worship on because he's coming. I really got country on getting ready for the Houston Rodeo. Come on, somebody. Am I right? Like, just like the TV show Cribs, you always got to go into the kitchen. You got to look in the fridge. Am I right? We, I take Gia. We look in the fridge. He sees I got spicy water burger ketchup. I'm like, he's like, my man. I'm like, my man. And then we start heading to, start heading to, the master bedroom, we're walking through the hallway, through all the rooms, and, I, and I'm taking them like, Jesus, come on, man. I'm going I'm to show you this is pretty amazing. And as you're walking, Jesus is following, but he stops. And he notices that there's a room right here. And it's a room that's got multiple locks on it. It's a room that it's duct taped. It's got a stay out sign. There's like mildew happening. It's dark. There's no light. There's, there's marks and there's scars and there's, there's cracked. And he's like, yo, Brandon, hey. Hey, what's in this room? Hey, don't worry about that Jesus, man. You don't worry about that. Hey, bro, bro, you know, bro, bro, bro. Hey, how many know? Anybody start saying, bro, 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 bro. They about to lie. <laughs> bro, Jesus, you know, bro, you don't, you don't want to be He's like, no, no, no. You don't want to go in there. There's too much pain, Jesus. That's, like, we're trying to forget about that. He's like, no, no, no. I'm pretty sure that I'm here for this room. Let me in. You finally let him in. Jesus walks in the room. He realizes that the window's been sealed up and there's no light coming in. There's broken memories and picture frames from people that have hurt you and abused you and pain of the church and pain of, from pastors and pain from leaders and just life and hurt. And, and there, there's marks on the wall and there's, there's scars on the wall. And he notices that the vent is off. There's just mildew everywhere. You're like, you're like, Jesus, that's good, man. Hey, that's enough time in here. Hey, I let you in. You know, at least I let you in, bro. Hey, come on, let's go. And like, Jesus like, no, no, no. Yeah, you let me in, Brandon, but it's very clear you still need some freedom. You got to let me go to work. It's the second point today. Let him in. You got to let him work. You got to let Jesus work because when you give your life to Jesus, it does not fix all your problems. So will you humble yourself enough, like I said in 2 Chronicles, to admit that I got a problem, I've tried to hide it into my heart, but I still need some work. I need some work in my life. Jesus is looking around in the room. He's looking around the room. He's like, yeah, man. In fact, you would think Jesus wouldn't be happy, but this is where he thrives. Joy begins happening. He's like, you finally let me in. You finally let me go to work in your life. And he's looking around and, and he's seeing, he's seeing the lights get, man, we got to take this off the window. We got to get some light up in this place. And I see these scars and, and I see these scratches and all everything. Don't worry about that. That just brings character to the place. Go ahead and tell Chip and Joanne, I'm the original fixer upper, right? Like I got, every, I got everything that I'm going to do. Like, man, I see this, this, all these pain and these broken memories. That's all right. I can in the restoration business. I can take bad things and I can make them good again. And I can take dead things and I can make them alive again. And I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking around. I see, I see the, the vent is all mildew. There's no air. We got to open this up. We got to get air flowing if we don't, it'll get into the whole house and the whole house will come down. Then Jesus looks because he's a carpenter and he notices that there's a wall that's been added that was not a part of the original foundation. And it's a wall that you put up, a wall of offense, a wall of bitterness, a wall of just angry, unforgiveness, they did you like this, you ain't ever going to forgive them. God let you down, how am I going to believe in a God who let me down? I thought he's a God who never lets anybody down. 
Jesus is looking around saying, hey, you got to let me work. You see this wall? You got to stop separating yourself from the things of God. I came to the cross because I came to break chains. I came to knock some walls down. I came to make things better. I came to make things brighter. You got to let me go to work. You got something that has a hold of you that should not be a hold of you. The Bible calls that a stronghold. Something that you think is stronger than you, but it's not stronger than you. Here's what it says in Scripture. We'll begin to land this plane. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 says this. It says, for though we live in the world where we do not wage war as the world does, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. Here's the power of Jesus right here. Here's why you let him in, and here's why you let him go to work for you. It demolishes strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus. Come on. If you want to take notes, it's on the screen. Here's what a stronghold is. If you don't know what this is, a stronghold is this. It's a prisoner locked by deception. Living life by something that is not true. Let me say it another way like this. You have bought into a lie that the devil wants you to believe is true. That's why it says that he came to demolish strongholds, arguments, pretensions, because the devil, how many know the enemy, the devil, he can't create anything, right? He can only manipulate what God created. And he does everything he can to try to confuse the truth of God's word. That's why I said earlier, we playing Tetris with the Bible so much, like there ain't nothing confusing about God's word. You follow the God of the Bible, it's the playbook to life. If you want to win in the game of life, you get to know the playbook and you follow God's word. But the enemy will do everything he can to try to confuse the truth of God's word. But even more than that, please hear me, the devil does everything he can to try to confuse God's truth about you. He makes you think that you don't fit the miracle. He makes you believe that that addiction, you just might as well just tuck it away into the corner of your heart because you've tried to break free from it. You might as well give up. You'll never break free from it. You might as well go ahead. You're, you've had sleep anxiety. You, you haven't been able to sleep. You always might have just learn how to cope with it. Find the right medication. Find the right thing. Breakthrough will never happen for you. Healing will never happen for you. And the enemy has caused you. It will try to get you to get into a stronghold to where you tuck it away into the corner of your heart thinking that you can never find a miracle. But can I tell you, friends, how many know we still serve a miracle working God? Come on, I thought I'd get more than seven people than that. How many know we still serve a miracle-working Savior? It's just like if you heard the story of an elephant. You know, when they train elephants, one of the strongest animals on planet Earth, they start with the big chain. But eventually, they switch out that chain with the rope. If you go to the zoo, you'll, you'll see a rope tied around their foot. Why is that? Because an elephant is strong enough, can easily break that rope. But even though he has the strength to break it, he doesn't believe that he can break it. This is why it's powerful to go back and listen to week one that Pastor Daniel preached, because he talked about a new mindset. Because don't let the devil trick you into believing something that has defeated you when Jesus said, I already went to the cross. I defeated the very thing. Stop letting it have a stronghold on you. I'm a stronger man. I already defeated death, hell, and the grave. And if I defeated death, hell, and the grave, you better believe that I can defeat the situation that the enemy's trying to throw at you. You gotta believe that breakthrough can come for you, but you gotta let him work. First John 3 verse eight says, the reason that the Son of God appeared while Jesus came. Check it out. He came to destroy the devil's work. 
He came to fight for you. Don't dismiss the lion of Judah that we have. Don't dismiss the lion in the war of the God that we have. You're not fighting alone. You got a God who is with you. You got a church family who is with you. And the Bible says the same blood that ran through the veins of Jesus is the same blood that runs through you. And that blood means healing. That blood means breakthrough. That blood means deliverance. That blood means freedom. So stop letting the devil beat you up in something that God has already beat him in. Come on, somebody. You got to let Jesus in. You got to let him go to work. Why? Because you deserve a new you. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. We're going to close. Y'all know every pastor has at least four closings. Come on, lean in. We almost done. Y'all still with me? How many glad you came to church? Come on, anybody? You glad you came? Come on, I'm telling you right now, you're going to leave here different. You're not going to be the same. Here's my third point is this. One, you got to let him in. Got to let Jesus in. You got to let him work. Before I throw out that third point, let me say this. I'm sure I've stirred a lot of your hearts, but I can't answer all your questions today. But here's the good news about our church is we have a next step for you. What we call that, that next step for you, we call it freedom groups. Come on, how many have been a part of a freedom group? Make some noise. We got groups launching, but today, freedom groups, you're just saying, Brandon, I want to have an obedient heart, but I got some work to do that's in my heart. Freedom helps you work out those things you're trying to hide in your heart. And can I tell you, it's 12 weeks. Like, I'm too busy, man. I'm too busy, Brandon. Man. I got so much going on. What is 12 weeks when it comes to eternity? Go through freedom so you can be a better dad. You can be a better mom. You can be a better husband. You can be a better wife. You can be a better friend. 12 weeks to become a better you. Why not? You can sign up today. You can go to HopeCity.com. You can go to the Blue Connections banner out there. Talk to our team member before you leave here today. Sign up for a freedom group today. We'll have more groups over the next two weeks that are going to be coming up as we launch groups in two weeks. But go ahead and make it a statement today that this year, I'm not only going to let Jesus in and walk in true relationship, but I want to let God go to work in my life. And I want freedom. You can do that by signing up for a freedom group. Let them in. Let them work. Here's my last point. Here it is. If there's always room. Come on, how many thankful that we serve a God, not just of one chance, but we serve a God of second chances. How many thankful for the grace of Jesus that even though we've left him, he's never left us. He's a good, good God. Let me read two scriptures and we're going to close. John 14, verse 1 and 2 says this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough. Come on, somebody shout more than enough. Come on, shout it like you mean it. More than enough. More than enough room in my Father's home. 1 Samuel 2, 8 says this. I love this about the heart of God. He puts poor people on their feet again. He rekindles burned out lives with fresh hope. Come on, I love that. Restoring a reset of dignity and respect to the lives a place in the sun. Here's my passion to you, friends. Can I tell you, I know that I gave God my heart at eight, but I did not give him a beating heart until I was 23 years old. But in that moment that I fully gave my life to Jesus, at 23, that was the year that I met my amazing wife. We've been married now for almost 19 years. Come on, somebody. Four amazing kids. It was in that year God called me out of the sports world into full-time ministry. It was that year that I saw, that I started tithing more than ever and faithfully, that I saw the blessing of God in my marriage and in my family. And ever since then, from year after year, these last some odd years, 19 plus years, man, I've seen God's favor, I've seen his anointing, and I've seen his blessing because I chose to give him an obedient heart. And now here we are, part of an amazing church family that we so love. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And I know that's straightforward, but I love you enough to say, does God have your whole heart? Don't go into this year without letting go of things that you know you need to let go of. 
take the next step to let God go to work. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus didn't die on the cross to be a part of your top three. Died on the cross to be number one in your life. Whether you're sitting in the room or you're watching online right now, God can go right through the lens of that camera and touch you in your living room watching right now. You're sitting at your cubicle at work. God can touch you right now. The Holy Spirit is moving in the room. Jesus is asking right now, in a second, I'm going to ask you to throw your hand up on the count of three. And I don't want you to just slide it up like it's slow. Because I saw you go crazy and shout when we talked about the Texans. You go crazy at a touchdown. You go crazy at a shot in the basketball game with the run. You go wild. Make a statement with heaven and throw your hands up. Just a moment, you saying you want Jesus in your life. Whether it's the first time or maybe you need to rededicate your life. You're saying, I've given God my heart, but I'm not giving it an obedient heart. And can I tell you, don't let shame grip you. We're a house here. We don't judge one another. We love you right where you are to help you get to where you're going. We got hands already going up. Ready? One, two, three. Boom. You need Jesus. Throw it up. Throw it up. Come on. Throw it up and keep it up. Come on. Keep it up. Keep it up. I'm not trying to get a camera shot. I just want to see you. Come on. Keep your hands up. There we go. I see you, my friend. I see you in the back. Come on. So many hands going up. I see you all the way back there. I'm so proud of you. I love you. Come on. Anybody else? Any more hands? I see you. I see you. I see you. Yeah, I see you back there. Come on. One more hand just went up. Come on. We love you. Come on, old city. The Bible says when one comes to heaven, all the heaven throws a party. Come on. Can we celebrate? Come on. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Come on. Powerful, powerful. Come on, everybody, pray this prayer after me. Come on, pray this prayer. I want you to pray it loud, and I want you to pray boldly. Somebody shout, Jesus. Come on, shout it loud. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood for me. Take away my sins. Today, I don't just give you my heart, but I give you an obedient heart. Today, I choose to live for you, for you. Amen. You look at me just real quick. How many are in the room? There's something you've been dealing with. You tucked it away into the corner of your heart, but you're believing God for a breakthrough. Maybe you need a healing in your body. Maybe it's addiction, pain. I don't know what it is, but I just want to pray for you. Come on, throw your hand up. Come on, don't be, if you need something, you need a healing in your body. You're ready to let it go today. How many believe God can set them free today? Come on, hands going up everywhere. I believe God can do it. Because you know what's going to happen? You, thank you. You can put your hand. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to hand it over to Pastor Andy and Sydney. Here, you know what's going to happen is you're going to leave here today, and you're going to walk on some friends. You're going to be like, hey, what happened to you? There's something different about you. That's right. There's a new me this year. There's a new me. I found Jesus. You're going to walk home. Your kid's going to notice something like, yeah, mom and dad are different. You're going to see a new mom around here. You're going to see a new dad around here. You're going to see a new husband around here. You're going to see you, you're a business, and you got your own business. You're going to walk in, and you're going to be like, man, what's up with you? you going to see a new boss this year. I found Jesus again. God's going to go to work in my life. And I'm telling you right now, you're going to hold on to that. And God's going to do a miracle with everybody just lifted their hands here today. Can I pray over you before we dismiss and they come to close us out? Father, I thank you for everybody. Come on, throw your hands up to heaven. Come on, everybody. Father, I thank you for every person that is in this room right now. Every hand that went up and every prayer that is in the heart of every individual. Father, we pray healing. We pray deliverance. We pray breakthrough right now in Jesus' name. If you've had addiction, I feel like there's there's few in the room. I just feel it in my spirit. It's been holding on to you for the last three years, and I pray right now in Jesus' name, if you receive it, you will leave here today, and you will not crave that thing anymore, Father. Addiction is going to be set free today in Jesus' name. You are going to be healed. Blood work is going to come back the way it's going to come back. There's a broken relationship between a mom and a daughter, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but can I tell you right now, God is saying, if you give me your obedient heart, I'll bring her back home with an obedient heart. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for every single person, every father, every mom, every husband, Lord God, every daughter, Lord God, every household here today. I pray your blessing and I pray your favor, Lord, this year more than ever. And in Jesus' name, if you believe in Hope City, come on, somebody shout amen and give God some praise.